Good afternoon, colleagues. I hope you can hear me in the back over there. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Shidesh Kapoor. I'm the president and principal of King's College London, and it's my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you now, as you would know. Uh, we are gathered here to hear the launch, and that's the right metaphor, of the Defence Space Strategy, which will set out a vision for UK as a global actor in a space domain that is increasingly congested and competitive. Uh, it will articulate how the ministry will deliver the protect and defend goal of the national space strategy. We are very grateful to the Ministry of Defense, to the minister, the chief of air staff, for using us as a launch pad for the strategy. As some of you would know, King's has had nearly a 200 year history of a very constructive partnership with our armed forces. Um, I might need to remind you that our founder was the Duke of Wellington. A commendable number of King's alumni have served in the armed forces. Several officers have served as principals of King's. But the number that we're most proud of are the number of senior armed services personnel who go on to become the alumni of King's through their association with our Joint Staff College in Shrivenham. And that, on that accord, I'm really delighted to announce that just a few weeks ago, we announced that this partnership between King's and military education will continue for another seven years. So it is a particular pleasure to welcome the Minister for Defence Procurement, Honourable Jeremy Quinn, a welcome to you, our Chief of Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston. Sir Mike, of course, is no stranger to these quarters. We've had the privilege of hearing from you on the issue of net zero as a speaker. But one of the reasons why we are all here is because of the Freeman Air and Space Institute. It is an institute set up at King's to provide independent original knowledge and understanding of air and space issues. And I would particularly like to thank the support that Air Vice Marshal Half Smith has provided to the Freeman uh, Institute. Uh, but the reason the Institute stands, of course, is Professor John Gerson. He's the founding director of the Institute. He holds a chair in national security studies. And we're, of course, proud that he's not only a professor, but was also a student at King's. So with those words, I hand it over to you, John, uh, to continue with the proceedings. And a welcome to all of you. Principal, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're delighted to be here today hosting this important release of the Defence Space Strategy. Um, the Freeman Institute is a valued cooperation between King's, the RAF and DSTL. And while our Institute focuses on air and space power, Space is a subject that we have devoted significant attention to and has been a recurring topic in our activities. Friedman Center Institute has published a range of papers on space subjects as diverse as Mediating Space Security, the author of which is in the room, um, Space Situational Awareness Warfare, and the Integrated Review and UK Space Power. Um, all of them are available online. Indeed, our first fully funded PhD position was awarded to Julia Baum, the previously said author, who's in the room, I believe, uh, for her project on space policy. And we've since invested in two more PhD projects being undertaken by Ben Norfield and Aaron Dawson, who are both with us today. It's work like theirs that's going to shape air and space policy in the future. And the Freeman intends to go further in the coming years by identifying ways to support wider access for underrepresented groups to work on air and space power subjects. So space has been a recurring topic because it is one that's clearly going to impact our future national security and that of many other countries, as well as core defense activities and posture. Following the launch of the National Space Strategy last September, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our keynote speakers for this launch. Minister for Defense Procurement, Jeremy Quinn MP. Uh, Mr. Quinn worked in corporate finance for 25 years, latterly as managing director of Deutsche Bank was elected an MP for Horsham in 2015 and has since served as a senior whip and parliamentary secretary in the cabinet office. He was appointed Minister of Defence Procurement in February 2020. And a great friend of Freeman, uh, the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston, joined the Air Force in 1986 on a university scholarship and qualified on Tornado in 1992. He served a number of overseas positions, tours rather, including Iraq, Qatar and Afghanistan. In 2015, he became commander of British Forces Cyprus, following tours as Assistant Chief of the Air Staff and Deputy Commander Capability. He was appointed Chief of the Air Staff in July 2019. 
The speakers are going to introduce the document, and then there'll be a short uh, media Q&A followed by a panel discussion uh, thereafter. Mr. Quinn, Cass. Thank you, John, and thank you, Professor Kapoor. And actually, on a personal level, I'm, I'm speaking at uh, Shrewdham on Thursday, and I, I'm delighted that we have that continuing uh, partnership. We get a lot out of it. Our personnel get a huge amount out of it. And it's, a, uh, it's great to be working together for another seven years. Uh, the Professor introducing also told me something I had not known before coming here today, which is the role of Wellington in founding this very august uh, institution. Um, it's fair to say that Wellington uh, was a better uh, soldier uh, than he was a uh, politician. Uh, it said that when he called as Prime Minister, he was Prime Minister for a couple of years, when he called his first cabinet, uh, he, de he described how he had got them all together, sat them in the room, and given them their orders. And he went on to say, and blow me, they sat there wanting to discuss them. I've got no idea what they were thinking. Um, I've got no idea what he would have been thinking about the challenges we now face. For hundreds of years prior to uh, Wellington and since, uh, we've been facing threats on land and at sea. Uh, for the last century, uh, we've been facing the challenge of air warfare. Uh, it is in the nature of modern technology uh, that we continuously have to evolve to face the threats of the future. It is a huge pleasure to be here today to discuss one such opportunity and threat. It's the next step in the execution of our integrated review, the uh, Defence Command Paper and DSIS. A lot has happened in defence since we launched those documents last year, from assisting in homeland resilience in issues as varied as vaccine delivery to HGV support, to the largest Royal Navy deployment in decades, making our positive presence felt on the very far side of the world. Above all, as I speak, the Defence Secretary is meeting NATO partners across Europe, discussing the truly concerning situation on Ukraine's borders, the most serious threat of a major uh, war on our continent since the fall of the Berlin Wall. However, the, the British people know what they can always expect from UK defence, its calm and determined delivery. And while meeting our operational commitments, we are continuing to progress a positive future for defence to ensure that we can meet the threats of the future with the most modern, integrated, technologically advanced forces reaching out through every domain. One of the threats of the future we need to face, a threat that has the ability to fundamentally threaten so many of our key interests in and from space. Building on our national approach published last year, we promised a defence space strategy, which I'm proud to announce today. We know the opportunities that space delivers from effective global communications through to ISR. We also know of the threat. Several states are pursuing hostile capabilities that can disrupt and deny others' use of space. A few months ago, Russia recklessly destroyed an inactive satellite, sending debris spinning around the Earth and endangering the International Space Station. Just consider a simple single fleck of paint traveling in space at five miles per second in low orb Earth orbit can cause huge damage to critical space assets. But what we're talking about here with Russia's action is at least 1,500 pieces of debris that we can track. In reality, it's probably tenfold that, traveling at that speed through space with potential to cause disastrous results to any space equipment with which it collides. Such irresponsible actions underline the dangers in a domain on which we place ever greater reliance. Satellite constellations in orbit link up almost every aspect of our daily lives, from mobile phones, the internet and television, to transport networks and the world's financial trading systems. Our allies and we rely on space to deliver global communications, provide surveillance intelligence and missile warning, as well as support are deployed forces globally. So our new defence space strategy sets out a plan for us to become more resilient, more robust, and a more significant space player on the global stage. We've begun laying the groundwork. 
last April, we established the Single Joint UK Space Command that will conduct day-to-day -day space operations, deliver leading edge capabilities and generate the force structure we need. And last September, we published our first integrated national space strategy. It set out our ambition to strengthen the UK status as a world-class space nation and become one of the most innovative and attractive space economies in the world. Defence is integral to this ambition. So we've been investing to deliver. In addition to the five billion pounds over 10 years already allocated to our future Skynet satellite communications, a further 1.4 billion has been allocated to support defence operations over the next decade. Our priorities are set out in today's strategy. 970 million pounds will go into our new ISTARI programme. This puts in place the foundations of the next generation constellation of ISR in low Earth orbit. They'll be fitted with a variety of sensors, which can see across multiple aspects of the spectrum, allowing for 24 seven observation capabilities, whatever the weather. Related to this, we're investing 61 million in a program called Titania, which will experiment with optical laser communication technology. This will enable the transfer of data into and from space at an equivalent capacity to high-speed broadband. 85 million is destined to develop our space domain awareness capabilities, enhancing our ability to properly understand activity in space, stretching as far as geostationary orbit and beyond, more than 36,000 K away from the Earth. Our space domain awareness activity also includes close collaboration with our US and Australian partners on the Deep Space Advanced Radar Capability Programme announced last July by the Defence Secretary. 135 million pounds has been allocated to boost our command and control capabilities over the decade. Besides underpinning our new Space Command, this cash will deliver our Aurora Programme, developing the architecture on which we'll build game-changing apps so our commanders can make rapid decisions in real time. Finally, we are investing 145 million on space control to explore capabilities that, that can deliver carefully calibrated effects to protect our access to space and our operational independence. Our ambitions don't end there, and they're not capped at 1.4 billion. So today I'm delighted to announce we're going to invest a further 127 million pounds over the next four years in Minerva. This project emerged from a Dragon's Den star process, testing the great ideas that come from the Defence Innovation Unit. Minerva is about the best means to deliver the digital backbone upon which our space enterprise will depend. It is focused on the processing power, the radio frequencies, the imaging capabilities and the data streams to deliver space-based intelligence. Not only will it make us fully interoperable, enabling us to tap into our key space allies, but it will allow us to share what space-derived data we discover across every domain in a timely manner. Best of all, we're working closely with UK companies to deliver it. Together, Minerva and ISTARI will form the building blocks of our defence space ISR capability. Collectively, they'll help us learn lessons about how to spirally develop our capabilities in an agile manner, outpacing both the rapidity of technological advancement and potential adversaries. As I hope I've begun to show, this strategy is more than just about capabilities. It is about partnerships government working as one with industry and international allies. With this in mind, I'm delighted to announce another really exciting innovation. Our Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, DSTL, is manufacturing a tiny shoebox-sized satellite, satellite, otherwise known as Prometheus 2. Manufactured in the UK, it is operated by the company In Space Missions, with ground station support from DSTL's international partners and Airbus Defence and Space UK. Despite its tiny size, Prometheus's payload will include a hyperspectral imager from Cosine Measurement Systems, global positioning receivers from the University of New South Wales, a wide field of view imager from Canadensis, and multiple software-defined radios from Airbus UK. This exciting project is hugely innovative. We're testing the concept, experimenting, pushing the boundaries, investing to stay on the cutting edge. And on top of this huge pipeline of space investment, coming down the track, we've got our Skynet 6A satellite being built by Airbus Defence and Space 
it remains on track for launch in 2025. These investments are about security, but they're also about prosperity. Government has already helped to create a thriving UK space sector worth over 16.4 billion per year, with a strong talent pipeline employing over 45,000 people in fields from satellite manufacturing to research. This makes the UK an excellent location for space businesses. The funding I've announced today represents a significant boost for the UK space industry and will play a key part in stimulating wider innovation, commercialization and growth. Rest assured, we will continue working ever more closely with industry to develop the space technologies needed to maintain our advantage and amplify our competitive edge. Knowing that, as we do, our innovative space research and development will inspire a new generation and enhance the expertise of an entire sector. So today, we're boldly pushing back the frontiers of our defence space ambitions, not just enhancing our military resilience, strengthening our security, and furthering our prosperity. We are applying rocket boosters to the UK's innovative instincts and helping our space sector surge ahead of the threats we'll face in the future. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to hand over to the Chief of the Air Staff. Sir Mike. With this strategy, the Ministry of Defence will protect and promote the UK's interests in space and will take a leading role in the coalition of like-minded nations and organisations who've come together to ensure that space is there for the benefit of all. Space is fundamental to our national security and our way of life. Any loss or disruption of our access to space would have a disastrous effect on people's day-to-day -day lives. What is happening hundreds of miles or more away is not something our average citizen frets about. We don't hear much about a disruption to space services at a personal level and how they could affect all of us. No bank transactions, little food on the shelves, no petrol in the pumps, traffic gridlock and a, and a malfunctioning national power grid. We are all dependent on space, whether that's in our personal lives or in my case, commanding air and space operations. So we must ensure the safety and security of the space domain. In defence terms, space gives us and our closest allies a unique operational advantage. Every military operation from a land battle to the carrier strike group is dependent on space. Space operations for the Royal Air Force are not conceptual or experimental forays into sci-fi. They are an essential element of the multi-domain integrated force of today. And space is a natural continuum of the air domain, where the importance of gaining and maintaining control of the air can equally apply in its way to the space domain. And we have work to do. Space is far from a benign environment. With almost daily cyber attacks and dubious subthreshold activity. In recent years, Russia and China have tested anti-satellite weapons, creating debris fields that will linger for decades, posing threats to the satellites and the space systems on which the world depends. Russian satellites continually make close approaches to other satellites, what we call rendezvous and proximity operations, possibly an indication of espionage activity or possibly rehearsing for something much more sinister. Meanwhile, China seeks to become the world's preeminent space power by 2045, an aspiration supported by its developments in cyber, electromagnetic and kinetic systems that potentially could threaten other users in space. So we must continue to build our understanding of what malign actors are doing in space and the means of protecting our critical interests and freedom of operation in space. We will do this through the UK Space Command, a joint command attracting our brightest and best, which was established at RAF High Wycombe on the 1st of April last year, bringing together a cadre of experts from across the United, United Kingdom Armed Forces, our allies, the civil service and industry to integrate, coordinate and deliver decisive space power in a truly national endeavour. At its heart, the UK Space Operations Centre is the UK Armed Forces operational level command and control organization 
that provides space effects across all domains and monitors what our potential adversaries are doing 24 seven. This was demonstrated only too clearly late last year with, with the Russian anti-satellite test you just heard uh, the minister speaking about. I'm proud to say our UK Space Operations Centre immediately proved its worth. It took a leading role in the debris tracking and categorization, which ultimately led to warnings of a potential threat to life to those working on the International Space Station, including Russian nationals. Last year, we published the UK's national space strategy. And today, I'm delighted to be here at the launch of, the, of our defense space strategy. In the context of what I've just described, it describes, it defines the Ministry of Defense's critical role in the protect and defend element of the national strategy. Utilizing our space systems and platforms, our operational expertise and our partnerships, while also growing our cadre of space operators ready for the challenges of the future. We have three strategic objectives. The first is protecting and defending our interests in and through space. This includes being able to identify and attribute threats to our space systems and then respond in a proportionate and coordinated way. Secondly, it's to integrate space operations into defense and security multi-domain operations, including the delivery of resilient and assured space services, such as satellite communications or intelligence gathering, which are crucial to our operations today and into the future. And thirdly, it's to develop, upskill and grow our cadre of space experts from across the Royal Navy, the Army, the Royal Air Force and the Civil Service, equipping future generations with the skills to face the threats of the future. Our ultimate success within the space domain rests with our next generation of space operators whose interest, intellect, experience and professionalism we must develop now. We will own our own capabilities and lead their development where there is a pressing sovereign advantage to do so. But we will collaborate where we can, from projects with our lead ally, the United States, to supporting the UK Space Agency's UK Space Launch programmes. And we will assure access to the shared resources of our like-minded allies and coalition partners. As you've already heard from the Minister, we are making considerable investments in our military capabilities through our defence space portfolio, capitalising on the UK's world-leading science and space technology sector. Our Skynet programme provides a constellation of assured and secure satellite communications, representing a strategic investment of £5 billion and a critical national capability into the 2040s and beyond. Our additional investment of 1.4 billion over the, the next decade that you, through the programs that you've just heard about, like Minerva, Istari, Aurora, and Prometheus 2, will enhance our understanding of the threats and hazards within the space domain. They will give our armed forces assured access to the highest quality real-time information and, and intelligence as they increasingly operate around the globe. They will provide novel sensor combinations able to identify and track targets and directly support the warfighter across all domains. And they will gain greater understanding of emerging technologies which can be used to protect and defend our interests. This coherent and growing program of investment will underpin our defense vision and mission in space in close collaboration with our strategic allies and partners. This is the foundation of an exciting future for UK defence in this exciting operational domain. Space is critical to the day-to-day -day life of every citizen in the United Kingdom. That is why this government has published the UK's first national space strategy. The ambition is clear. The space sector is important to the nation and as a nation, we must be at the forefront of the explosion of technological and commercial opportunities in space. And from a military perspective, its contribution to current and future multi-domain military operations is ever more significant and non-discretionary. That is why the publication of our defense space strategy is so important. To better protect and promote the UK's interest in space and make a leading edge contribution to the coalition of like-minded nations and organizations who have come together to ensure that space is there for the benefit of all. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, so we're questions. Sorry. <laughs> we're now going to take some questions um, um, from the press, uh, which I'm going to coordinate, but not with not with not manage. So if if, if we can have the first question, sit the whites of the eyes. And if you wouldn't mind uh, identifying uh, who you are where, and where you uh, who you work for. Um, thank you, John Paul Rathbone, Financial Times. Um, excuse this probably stupid question, but uh, it's taken a few years for the space strategy to come to fruition. And I just wondered what were the problems that had to be resolved or the focus that had to be resolved to arrive to where we are today, or the refinement? I'm glad to start off on that one, if you wouldn't mind, Kaz. Look, the, the, um, that's a slightly mean way of looking at it, if you don't mind me saying. I, I think I would look at it in a different perspective. Uh, we had a, a fantastic uh, settlement for defence uh, with the uh, spending review, uh, an extra £24 billion of investment. And it's right that we look at space in the correct context of the threat and making certain that we are investing appropriately in all the domains. Uh, so we had work to do uh, in sea, land, air, uh, but the other areas of investment in space and in cyber were absolutely necessary in the context of that integrated review and the Defence Command paper. Uh, so. It's not like we've not been involved in space. I mean, I think we first got involved in space in 69 and continuously since 1988. Uh, so we've, we've always had that awareness, that presence in the Skynet, uh, uh, five billion pounds has long been committed. Uh, but with the integrated review is a time for uh, pause and reflection about what do we really need to do to set ourselves up for the future and to make certain that we're covering off these, as Kaz was saying, these critical areas of capability. Um, and that's why I'm proud that we are standing now with a defence space strategy following hard on the heels of the national space strategy. But if Kaz wants to add into that. Um, only to say that it reflects a uh, the growing significance of all space domain activity in defence and across government, which mirrored the, the, the explosion over the last decade in, uh, in space uh, access, space ex exploration, and, the, uh, the, and, and launches into the thousands per year, which is you know, unprecedented compared to previous years. So we are, uh, you know, so, so we are reflecting what is happening more widely in in the space domain, and um, and the, the the fact that the space strategy is launched as a document today, it doesn't mean to say that we haven't been working to a strategy uh, in you know within uh, within the Ministry of Defence because we have, and it has been a uh, a journey to get to this point, and I'm delighted that we can openly talk about the significant uplift in investment, the rationalising of all of our space activities in the Ministry of Defence around and around UK Space Command, and the way that plugs into other parts of government like the UK Space Agency and, uh, and, uh, and, and the ambition for this government for the UK to take a leading role in space. Hi there, uh, Tim Robinson, Aerospace Magazine, Royal Aeronautical Society. A um, couple of things didn't get seem to get mentioned, or at least uh, I, I don't think they were mentioned, is uh, Artemis and precision and navigation timing, uh, you know, the Galileo replacement, which you would have thought have a strong military uh, application and role. So, so what's happened to those two, please? Yeah, so, so um, the some of the programmes that we mentioned there are are capping programs and Artemis, and in particular, some of the things that we learned in Artemis around uh, the command and control and the uh, uh, the uh, how you communicate with with space systems, how you share, how you move information, the ground the ground stations element of that is a uh, is a core part of some of the other programs that were mentioned. So Minerva leading to the uh, the Istari uh, ISR. Uh, uh, network. So, um, so we learned an awful lot from Art Artemis. It was a rapid capability um, development program, and um, and it's alive and well as a constituent element of the programs that have been talked about uh, earlier earlier this afternoon. And just adding, particularly on PNT, you will find that it is uh, uh, specifically referred to in the document, Chapter Five, I think. Uh, but it's definitely in there, and uh, uh, and further work on it. And above all. On that is incredibly important. It is a huge area of focus, and I'm sorry to have to draw your attention to yet another uh, MOD strategy paper. There's been a lot of them over the last year, as you know. Uh, and if you look at our science and technology, 
uh, strategy. Uh, again, uh, PNT is an important part, of, and it's absolutely clear that's an area that we're going to be developing for the future. Yep. Hi, uh, it's Olivia from James. Uh, I'm just asking, do you have a timeline on Project Minerva? I know on the press announcement, there was a mention that there was, it was due to be, it's sort of commenced and it was due to be finished and finalized in due course. So I was just wondering if you have any more update on that. So, so Minerva has already begun and uh, it's a phased program initially looking at small numbers of satellites, then looking at how we uh, bring together packs of satellites that can cooperate together. And this is, uh, again, activity happening hundreds and hundreds of miles away at, 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 you know, at enormous speeds. And so how, we, how you control a formation of satellites uh, uh, collaborating closely is an area that we will explore in the next phase. And then the, the, and then the follow on phase after that is around how we collaborate with our allies and uh, like-minded nations, and most significant, of course, is, us, is the United States. All of that goes back to the Artemis ground stations I was talking about as well. And, uh, and this is um, something that we will be uh, uh, role, uh, uh, sort of developing each phase at a time over the next 10 years. Um, but the program has already begun, as I say. Um, gentlemen, gentlemen there as well. Well. I'm Connor String from the Daily Mail. Um, is it fair to say that the MOD is pre now preparing for war in space with Russia? And if that's the case, when do you think we could see that battleground shift from where it is now into 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 orbit in space? Our absolute objective is to prevent any risk of war in space. So the work we're doing at the United Nations, which the MOD uh, works with the Foreign Office on very closely, uh, with was a very well received uh, UN General Assembly resolution that the UK sponsored, uh, which is about establishing uh, norms and proper uses in space in the same way that you know, over many centuries we developed the ways of operating safely and securely at sea, we need to have the same norms established uh, in the uh, in, in space as well. And we're at the absolute forefront of that. So that's what we're about. We're about the safe exploitation of uh, space for the benefit of all people. That's our objective. Um, and uh, part of that is the investments you're seeing today, making certain, for example, that we have space domain awareness. So we are absolutely and acutely aware what others are up to, how the threat may evolve, and that we can call them out uh, when they fall below those norms that we are hoping to establish globally. From my, my perspective, I think um, planning for the worst and hoping for the best applies in this situation, as it does in many things in our world at the moment. I think you have to think through, you have to recognise some of the reckless, nefarious activity that is now going on in space that we haven't seen previously, and we have to be, given what I was saying a few moments ago, our, given our reliance on space in every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives, we have to think about how we make our activity in space, our, our key platforms in space, more resilient to that you know, nefarious, reckless uh, um, activity. Uh, it's, it, this is not about um, uh, weaponizing, in spe weaponizing space. This is about protecting our national interests in space. Got time for one more question. Sirs, uh, John Lake from uh, ADS Advance. I wonder, you, there's, there's obviously no faulting the vision and the forward looking nature of what you're talking about, but you talked about space becoming a more contested domain, which is obviously familiar mm. stuff. Do you see the primary threat to UK space capabilities as itself being space-based or ground-based? You know, is it a matter of primarily of cyber, espionage, all of this kind of thing, or is it a space-based threat to our capabilities? The simple answer is all of the above. Um, I mean, cyber is a very interesting point you raise. Uh, there is room for disruption 
and uh, deliberate miscommunication by cyber means to space assets. Um, there are things we can do about that. Actually, the, one of the programs I referred to, uh, operating via um, lasers enables rapid communications far harder to disrupt. Um, but uh, Mark, I don't know if you want to add into that. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, with something that we are so reliant on, it falls to us to explore every area that could be vulnerable and make sure that we are as resilient as we can be. And I, I would recognize all of those uh, areas that you described as potential vulnerabilities that we are addressing. Hand, hand up there and then we we'll may have to call it today. Thanks. Alan Thompson from Skyrora. Uh, I'd like to start by congratulating you on the, the launch of this new space strategy, uh, a document that can help companies and industry engage with this, this line of, of direction. Um, I'd be interested to ask the question about sovereign versus assured. I heard assured on a number of occasions already mentioned this morning, sorry, this afternoon, and uh, uh, obviously just heard a bit about the, the, the nation's interests. I'd, I'd be interested to know if there's a dynamic from assured towards more sovereign, and also I'd like to, uh, to understand how this document reflects how, it, how, how you are planning to engage with the new uh, capabilities that arise over these 10 years. Uh, the examples that we have within space and the outstanding example of Prometheus and this kind of project, how are you taking into account these new capabilities that you may need to uh, make, um, understand where you're gonna get them from and engaging with the uh, innovative companies who are going to be able to provide those capabilities. Thank you. Three points I made and then, and then uh... Uh, Chief of the staff will come in, and then perhaps I may have to depart, John, if that's that's okay with you. Um, on the uh, firstly, uh, our mantras um, uh, own, uh, collaborate, and, and access so that's set out in the in the document. Uh, um, but the uh, and there are areas that are going to be necessary sovereign capabilities that we will need to keep uh, onshore, um, and that is a dialogue we're going to be having with uh, industry. This launch was important, uh, but just like DSIS, it marks the start of an ever-growing uh, engagement uh, through that. But the key thing in terms of collaboration with our allies and, and access to other technologies is to have product, is, is to have skin in the game. Uh, there are countless examples in other fields uh, of endeavor in defense procurement when it is because we have something critical that we bring to the party that we get that uh, privileged access with our closest friends uh, to ensure that we can really drive this forward and achieve what we need to do uh, on a sovereign basis. So, uh, as I said, the mantra is uh, uh, own, collaborate, access. Uh, this is part of a journey we're, we're, we're going to be on. Um, I'd also like to mention the uh, you, you, you refer to uh, where we're going to be in 10 years' time, and you refer to innovation. This is such an extraordinarily exciting field but no one in this room knows for certain exactly where we'll be in 10 years' time. We could all give a good steer at exactly where we think we might be, but it depends on that innovation. And in that speech today, I get incredibly infused by how colleagues in the Ministry of Defence and elsewhere are, through Dragon's Den processes, other processes, seizing what is a hugely rich scene in academia here in the UK, and a really exciting nascent space uh, industry. I say nascent 16.4 billion a year is a significant uh, is a significant industry we have in the UK. I'm making certain that we are driving these innovative ideas. Some of them will succeed and flourish. Some of them won't. But we're on that journey, and I think it's absolutely critical. The timing is right now for us to make this investment uh, to ensure that we are going to be driving that innovation forward and. Uh, if it's not corny, I'd say the sky's the limit, but uh, probably is. Mike. Minister, thank you. Um, the sky isn't the limit, I suppose. So, so that, that balance between um, sovereign and assured use of allied uh, capabilities and systems, I think that's an excellent question for the expert panel that will follow us. <laughs> but all, all I would add is that um, I, th I think everyone in the room from the space and aerospace industry would recognise the, the significant and clear statement of intent from this government mm -hmm. around sovereign capabilities. You know, it's, it's in the industrial strategy and, uh, and it could not be more prominent in our, in our decision making. So that, I, would, I would leave you with that thought, but do come back to that question. And then the point about rapid cap capability adoption, that is exactly the principle 
that the team from the um, uh, from UK Space Command are adopting. They, they are following the the uh, the ethos and the principles of the RAF's Rapid Capability Office. We want to engage with small and medium enterprises. We want to know what's going on. And the Prometheus program is, and it, plus it's through DSDL, is a fantastic example of that. Um, and I know that there is more to come in that regard. Well, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much for uh, the launch of a really interesting document, which we're going to discuss in a bit more detail. So could I, once we transit to our expert panel, who are gonna take the, the tough questions. Um, if you could just have one minute in place stand up but don't leave the room and we'll we'll reconvene in one minute as we let the minister cast Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. all right thank you so with the uh the, the setup from uh cas uh to this panel to answer the tough questions uh and introduce our panelists briefly and then move straight on to questions. Um, our executive director, Mr. David Jordan, is going to be loitering with a laptop taking questions from space, uh, uh, ether and, and space in, in this case. And we're going to try and make it work together. So forgive us if it's a bit clunky to start with. Um, so I will just go through in the, in the, or, in the order that I printed it, but, but, but there's no uh, uh, primacy at all. Um, um, Harv Smith, Smith um, Air Vice Marshal, uh, is the UK's Director of Space, leading the Space Director of the Ministry of Defence. The Directorate was responsible for the development of the Defence Space Strategy and assisted another panellist, uh, who I'll introduce in a minute, Rebecca Everenden's team at uh, BEIS in the development of the National Space Strategy. The Directorate is also responsible for capability planning across government and international coherence. Air Vice Marshal Paul Godfrey is com commander of, of what we heard as UK Space Command, joint organization which was formed in April of last year and officially stood up at their new headquarters at High Wycombe on the 29th of July. Nice, impressive building that I walk past uh, on the way to our sponsors uh, sometimes. The command's role is to deliver the operational training and capability aspects of the Defence Space Strategy. Natalie Moore is Head of Space Policy at the Ministry of Defence. She was also involved in producing last year's national space strategy, ensuring that defence activity aligns with and supports wider government ambition for space. And Rebecca Everenden is the first director of space for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. She leads BEIS's space directorate established last year as a collaboration with the MOD, as well as support from other government departments. So a panel who should be able to answer all the questions about space. Now, excuse me whilst I transit to the uh without falling to the uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was a, that was a, um i'm going to abuse the uh the chair's position and uh and ask the first question and then probably we'll take a question from from the internet um, thereafter um, as we heard uh, from one of the earlier questions people have been pressing for this strategy to uh, arrive for for some time uh the minister said that was a bit unfair um my question is, what does this launch mean for you as deliverers of the policy? What are you now enabled to do that you could not before? Who wants to start that off? I'll, I'll start, I should say, we led on. So thanks, John. Um, I think uh, the reality is there's very little that we've not been able to progress uh, in the time that we've been waiting to get the strategy published. Um, and the reason for that is because of what the Minister talked about earlier, which is uh, specifically that we got the settlement in place nice and early. So we knew what money we had and we could get on and plan against that and it was all approved and profiled. What it does unlock for us though is what we've done today. And it's the ability to speak to our broader international partners across the sector to lay out our ambition and specifically to lay out exactly where we're allocating the money over the next decade. And hopefully that will help inform everyone that's outside looking in to UK defence and where our priorities sit and maybe how they skew their activity to help us do it um, as a collaboration, which is the theme of the whole strategy, really. It's collaborating and alliances, but it, it also allows us to build the path into the work that we're going to do next. And actually, that's really as important, if not more so. Um, and perhaps Natalie can talk to that in a second. 
um, as we shift our crosshairs off of policy writing and strategy and all the money uh, into the actual implementation planning. That's where the rubber will hit the road, but maybe Natalie, you want to take a bit more on that? Yeah, I mean, just a couple of thoughts. For me, I agree, agree with all of that. I think um, what it allows us to do in publishing this is send a really clear signal internationally about um, the fact that defence intends to be a meaningful player in space and that we intend to support global efforts to, um, to keep space safe and sustainable and preside, provide resilience to our allies and partners um, as we do that. So it allows us to send that really clear signal um, publicly. Um, I think the other point I wanted to make was it, it delivers one of the five goals of the National Space Strategy, which was to protect and defend UK interests in and through space. So this strategy really sets out in quite some detail how we're going to actually deliver that goal and feeds neatly into um, the implementation of the National Space Strategy, which my team is working very closely with Rebecca's team in shaping. So we're jointly coming up with the, um, the implementation plan and working that through now um so we're moving we've, we've already moved into implementation mode we're looking at where we can exploit synergies between um the civil side and the defense sphere um on the skills front on the capabilities front um on a number of different um fronts so i think uh, it's important from that perspective as well um just one from me if i may um the chief of the air staff uh, sort of trailed it but something for uk space command I know with industry colleagues and partners in the room, I've been trailing this previously anyway, but it sets out that we want to do this um, in a sort of agile manner. And certainly um, the delivery of the, of the announcement of the national of the defense space strategy today um, has allowed us to plan for a, a, an industry day that we'll be having on the, uh, on the 30th of March. Um, where actually we want to hear from you, where we want to hear how we can better integrate with you, how we can better collaborate with you, um, and how do we get those new ideas to bring into this strategy when you know how much we've allocated for various areas? And I think that'll allow you to come to that industry day better equipped to have that conversation and how we bring the SMEs into the discussion as well, those small companies. Um, I've been to several over the last uh, almost year that, uh, that I've been in the role here. Um, I always call them the lockups in Guildford, where there's some amazing stuff going on and how we bring that into uh, our future space uh, capability, I think, will be really important. Rebecca, do you want to talk on? Well, just to say, I mean, um, this is great to see that this strategy is out. Uh, as Natalie has said, it, it gets us ahead in implementing uh, one of the pillars of the National Space Strategy. Um, and, you know, we are now in full implementation mode. Uh, the strategy was published in September, given us a bit of time to work out how we want to the brigade, the work streams to ensure that we quickly move into delivery mode and and uh, Harv and I and um, and Paul and, and um, Natalie and our teams are working ever more closely to make sure that there's an integrated delivery plan for the strategy and of course the, the defence space strategy is absolutely at the heart of all of that. David, do you want to come in with a question from the internet? Yes, please. Um, Louisa Brown from the Times has been waiting patiently, um, and this might involve a bit of audience participation as well. Um, she inquires, uh, when the Chief of the Air Staff talks about Russia potentially rehearsing for something more sinister, um, does this mean attacking UK satellites, and what could the impact of this be? Um, I think that's a question as well that members of the panel may have a very vivid um, view on as well. Um, and whether the, the Chief wishes to intervene, I don't know, but I'll hand it over to you. I think the Chief's intervening, you'd like me to have a go at it. Um, so I, um, it's not necessarily a specific event. It's a conglomeration of all the different events that we see. Um, and when you bring that all together, it's the aggregate that paints a threat picture that is quite starkly different than what we've seen in recent years. And as Kaz very eloquently described earlier, it's about um, you know, planning for the worst and hoping for the best. And the defense space strategy, in particular, the early analysis that we did to underpin the thinking behind it was very much threat led. Um, and that, that threat analysis has forced us into a, a certain thinking on this is what the strategy needs to be. And up front on that, which has come out loud and clear today, is this idea of deepening and increasing our, our ability to conduct space domain analysis, which isn't just working out there's something up there. It's working out what's there, 
what it's doing, and importantly, what's the intent. And that SDA idea will then underpin how we take our other capabilities forward. So it's not just one thing, it's the aggregate of what we're seeing happening. Yes, yeah, certainly, I'd echo all of that. And uh, I think the Chief uh, and, the, uh, and the Minister uh, alluded to everything. To me, it's that final point. Um, it's ultimately about attribution, as we've done in, in a range of different areas. You could say the Novacek incident in Salisbury, ultimately, that was about attribution. Um, and so it is understanding what's, what's going on up there. You know, for the last 15 to 20 years or so, the Skynet constellation has sat there relatively unmolested. And the chief talked about rendezvous, uh, rendezvous and proximity operations. Um, which are concerning and you need specialized equipment to be able to see 36,000 kilometers away, which is two and a half times the distance between here in London and Sydney. You know, so attribution is difficult and that is what we are aiming to get at in terms of that space domain analysis that uh, the Harp talks about. Slightly following on from that, um, there's a brief section talking about uh, deterrence in, in the paper. Um, I just wondered whether you were seeing this, this domain as somewhere where, or should we put it, there's deterrence in space and there's deterrence of space. And I wonder wh wh where, where your thinking is, is going in terms of having response options, which might be one of those, but how far you see this, you know, and even in a crisis like the one we, we may or may not be facing in a matter of weeks, whether this is a, an, an area where we might see deterrence in as well as off space. So Natalie's actually sure. leading on this okay, one. So, yeah. oh, sorry, just a thought on deterrence, which is that I think we need to be careful about talking about space deterrence. So we talk very much, and our, our US colleagues talk about this too, but about integrated deterrence, mm -hmm. and that's integrated across policy, military, um, integrated across all domains, um, all, all capabilities, um, and very much integrated with our partners um, and, and taking a sort of effects-based effects approach that's very um, uh, tailored towards the adversary in in question so i do think we need to be cautious about um about narrowing our focus down to um space um space deterrence i was also going to just um as relevant to the last question as well just uh just bridge on to the importance of soft power in all of this um the the minister talked about it earlier but the work that the foreign and commonwealth development office is doing on um uh, rules and norms of behavior in space through the un and we're very very closely plugged into that from an mod um perspective and that in in a sense is deterrence in itself because that conversation that we're having internationally about establishing those baselines of um, acceptable behavior um are uh, of starting to build that international consensus around what is acceptable and um, taking examples like the recent um, Russian ASAT test and uh, and explaining why that that you know, collectively we um, as a community view that as in unacceptable behaviour. And I think, uh, John, if I, if I may, one of the key takeaways from this is how, just how multifaceted space is and how interlaced it is to everything we do. And sometimes we get way led to think that something going on in space means we must respond in space. And the reality is a lot of the time, the correct response to space action may happen in another domain. And having that broader approach, which is why we're so keen to do cross-government work, to work with international allies, uh, just allows us to have a much more sophisticated approach to this idea of integ integrated yeah. deterrence, which is say, uh, as I say, a little bit more elegant than just you did this in space, so we'll do this in space. Um, it's slightly more complex than that. Absolutely, absolutely. Obviously, donor strategies will be very interesting in space. Yeah. Um, David, do we have another question from the internet? Yes, we do. Uh, let me ask one from um, Philip Day. He inquires, outside of Launch UK, what can the military do to support the UK space infrastructure such that MOD has access to rapid diverse capability options. And you also, also asked a follow-up insofar as is the MOD planning to support um, civil efforts to regenerate and maintain MOD assets of um, the UK's own ownership or a hybrid of the two? Yeah, so uh, I'll take that one. The, we, we were out in the US last week, actually, and talking with the uh, United States Space Force about responsive launch Actually, they're calling it responsive access to space. You know, so that's about having, uh, if it's satellites, you know, it's about having those uh, in the store to be able to then rapidly launch them. You know, something uh, as we uh, 
you'll see this year uh, in terms of Virgin Orbit uh, operating out of Cornwall. So we're really interested to understand all of the elements of that. What do you need to do? And actually, is it something that we can provide uh, the wider allies uh, and partners? And in terms of regeneration, I think the um, proliferation of satellites in LEO and what we are doing um, with uh, Astari and a lot of the programs that you heard about today in low Earth orbit, sorry, throwing out space terms in, the, uh, in low Earth orbit, um, the advantage we have there is a sort of three to five year span where these things are deorbiting, um, which A, provides sustainability, but B, upgradability. Uh, when you come to these uh, these capabilities so it is a continuous churn of, of upgraded capability as um as companies like OneWeb and uh, and starlink uh, are actually showing so i think it's a um it's a hugely exciting area that is developing and and even um as the chief mentioned you know our uh, our most valued partner in in space the us is sort of on the learning curve of, uh, of these sorts of things at the moment I mean, just to add um, on launch, uh, you know, it's right there, one of our top commitments in the national space strategy, um, partly because it offers, um, you know, reliable, agile access to space from the UK. That's our goal. It's also, of course, a huge commercial opportunity. Um, and, you know, hopefully will stimulate a new part of the space sector. So, I mean, I think, you know, working really closely with the MOD, on the possibilities that the UK launch um, uh, capabilities would offer and making sure that we maximize that sort of part of the growth of the, the UK space sector. It's a great synergy. Do you mind if I just add on? So as we did the initial work on what has become the Astari program, and the minister alluded to this a little bit earlier, um, whilst we've, we've profiled the program over a decade, the reality is, uh, five years from now, we're not we're not quite sure what that's going to look like. We haven't defined it because we don't quite know what the technology is going to be. What we've put in place is an agile foundation that allows us to spiral as we see new technology come online. So, you know, the reality is what we don't want to do is invest in a piece of capability. If we use an analogy like uh, Nokia thirty two ten, send it into space. And then we're kind of stuck with playing snakes forever. And um, we want to get an iPhone up there with the right iOS. You heard us talk about uh, Prometheus looking at software defined radios so that when it's on orbit, we can reprogram it from Earth. It's not, it's very agile. We can get the next new app uh, into the capability that didn't, that app didn't exist six months ago. So it allows us to just keep that one pace ahead of. Where the technology is and importantly where potential adversaries will be all of our programs are built on that agile foundation and what goddess is doing with uh, with space command as the chief mentioned this rapid capabilities approach to how we develop that is quite a new approach for how defense will do acquisition but it's definitely required so we uh, have a question from the uh, from the floor from the room that, um, we would like to before I name things. Julia. Hi, Julia. Uh, just as you were talking about responsibility earlier, I noticed the DSS notes that it will embed dual use at the heart of the capability process for the best value of money. Uh, this can blur lines of responsible behavior and skew threat perceptions. Could you elaborate on how the promotion of responsible uses of space could be supported alongside these dual use ambitions? I should say Julia is our space PhD student at the moment, so no pressure there. So I, I, I'm happy to have a go at it, and then I'm sure everyone will have a view. Uh, so it's interesting because we had this discussion with the minister last night about dual use, and, I, and I'm going to steal his comeback uh, since he's not here to use it himself. But this idea that for as long as we've had telephones that have been dual use, we use them for civilian use, we use them for military use, it's an analog telephone system, and we've never batted an eye over the fact that we do that dual use. So that we should just be pulling that through to what we do with satellites. And my ISR satellite is DEFRA's Earth Observation Satellite. We're using a sensor to look for nefarious activity in a certain country. DEFRA is using it to check out coastal erosion in Norfolk. 
And we should have that much more sophisticated approach to the use of our assets, because the reality is we don't have and will never have the budget to build each different department having their own satellite constellation. So this idea of a national approach, and uh, Rebecca and I have talked about this for well over a year of we wrote a national space strategy and we're going to deliver it in a national way. And the dual uh, dual use approach is right at the heart of that. So I don't know if, if Rebecca, you want to? Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, I think this is this could be the sort of game changer in how we think about um, what we use space for uh, and how we uh, actually procure in the future. I suppose is the you know the, the real goal. How we think about how we procure, how we commission, how we use um, our assets in space for dual use purposes and. Um, you know that that's a sort of possibly a goal for the future but we need to start thinking about it now and we are doing that every day in how we start to take forward those goals set out in the space strategy so all of the strategy all of the ambitions are being thought about in an integrated way whether that's earth observation whether that's space domain awareness whether that's launch etc um so i think that you know that is what could get the uk really ahead in how we think about space and just uh, just in terms of the delivery of that um you know you mentioned the four of us sort of working closely together and, and all bait the ceo of the, uh, the uk space agency we speak an awful lot of the time about how we do this and about um how uh, they are transforming into a delivery organization that will be able to enable that uh, in the future and actually we two weeks time we've got a board to board with the uk space agency uk space command to talk about exactly this the dual use and how do we combine our uh, research and development? How do we combine our procurement procedures? How do we command and control these things when you've got that dual use aspect of what's going on? If DEFRA want to use it at a particular time, the defense might want to use it. I think those are the difficult things when it comes to um, trying to get at this, but it's not impossible. And so I think starting at the beginning, exactly as we are now, and we're fortunate in that, you know, Paul's come along at the same time as me. So we've been on the journey together um, that will allow us really to get into this. Could I just add one more point? And I, you know, I think that is just fantastic to see Space Agency and Space Command really sort of knitting together their thinking. And you know, Harv and I have recently launched something called a National Space Board, which does exactly the same thing at the sort of cross white or departmental level and brings together our decision making and our thinking about how we use space going forward. So you know, that board makes sure that dual use is being locked into our thinking as we develop new policy. Um, and new programs to deliver that policy. Just final observation yeah, yeah, from, a, from a behaviours point of view, because you were, I think, alluding to the UN um, norms and behaviours process. And I think um, one of the one of the goals of that process really is to try and avoid miscalculation by having this kind of commonly agreed baseline of what is acceptable behaviour. And I think irrespective of whether that's a dual use capability or a military capability, those um, that conversation is important in, in order to establish um, what normal looks like, um, uh, regardless of, of the nature of the satellite. I think it comes back to, to sorry, that attribution mm, in the end, yeah. ultimately, because one person's debris removal satellite is another person's military satellite removal satellite. Um, and so understanding exactly what's going on up there and being able to attribute, I think, is key when it comes to that. Yeah. There seems to be a very big question mark over the future resilience if this turns into a contested space. Yes, with people able to do things, space in the other term. Um, in the document, um, you state, we will also support scientific collaboration, research development, and further enhance our engagement with academia. I guess from that comes the question, what do you see as the role for academia in, in, in the next stages? Um, and I suppose how well, how, what is the state as you see it of, of UK academia for supporting your ambitions? Can I uh, just, one thing we haven't talked about is in the, in the upskill and cohere side of things. When, uh, on the journey to, uh, um, you know, looking at, uh, uh, a space academy um you know we're working with a number of academic institutions because what i don't want to do is from a defense perspective just put together learning in a stovepipe actually it has to be across all of the different elements and you know i see some nodding going on around in the room and certainly the discussions that we've had um you know i think people are looking to come and collaborate um in this side of things so um you know certainly we are at the moment, finding where the dots are in order for us to join the dots. And our, uh, from a, 
um, UK Space Command perspective, our training needs analysis comes uh, is uh, will be published to us um, in a couple of months' time. But it will not be the pure defence side of it. Right from the beginning, we're looking at wider academia um, and industry uh, as well. So uh, you know, we'll look for the sort of centre of excellence uh, when it comes to uh, learning um, and uh, and as it says, you know, building the workforce for the future. I think the whole question of partnership is yeah. a huge challenge when you're really trying to get very diverse organisations to work more closely together than perhaps they've done uh, in, in other areas. Yeah, so I, I think we've done a, I don't know, Rebecca, oh, wow. tell me otherwise, I think we've done a pretty good job of trying to integrate uh, space academia into the journey we've been on thus far. I know we've run various roundtables. I'm looking at, I know here he's I'm catching his eye to see if I'm telling the truth, um, to just make sure that our thinking was right as we did the analysis for the national strategy and certainly for the defence strategy. We did some uh, quite interesting early engagement with academia. I would also just link to FASI, and I know we've spoken about this a few times, um, the work that that you guys are doing in particular with the PhD students coming through, there's a real opportunity there for us to use their work to try to inform our early thinking, which then we would bring back into our engagement with industry and the broader sector. It, it comes back to my point earlier about it's a national strategy and it'll be delivered in a national way. And there's a very clear section of the national space strategy, which is about skills and academia. Um, we talk about it as the UK space enterprise, and there's a fundamental role there for academia, for sure. Rebecca? Yeah, well, I, I'm sure if, uh, if our science minister, Minister Freeman, were here, uh, he would want to talk about the importance of science behind you know, innovation and get, keeping our space sector at the cutting edge. Um, you know, he would say, I think that the government's going to invest record levels uh, of money into research and development uh, and you know that the key to maximizing this for the space sector is about making links with the other sectors that we need to work closely with going forward and so i think you know it's a very good news story actually that we are putting science and academia right at the heart of our thinking here and using you know the amazing science and talent base that we've got in the uk to really really drive forward that thinking and that innovation that will you know give us the competitive advantage Thanks, David. I think we've got one, one more question from the on, online, perhaps. Yes, certainly. Um, from uh, Catherine Courtney, who will be known to any of the panel, um, saying she'd like to ask whether, um, or ask the panel to share their views on the criticality of space domain awareness to assuring national security and prosperity. Do they see this as a capability area where the UK can, in inverted commas, punch above all weight? I'll take that one. Um, you know, as, so as Commander UK Space Command from day one, it is, that's my number one priority. Uh, and it comes back to that attribution point that I talked about. I do, I genuinely do think we can punch above our weight just because of the caliber of people that we do have looking at the information um, that comes into our space operations center. Um, uh, just two years ago, or at the end of uh, 2020, we established a commercial integration cell in there. So it is bringing in, you know, an awful lot of people in the room. Um, and actually, I think Aurora was mentioned in the um, uh, in the speeches, uh, and that's a software. Uh, and I think the minister mentioned it. That uh, you know is an, an iOS, if you like, that brings together what is currently fifteen different systems. And so, from my perspective, and, you, and you'll see when you look at the figures in there, eighty-five million on space domain awareness. If you were doing it in numbers, that wouldn't be a priority. But actually, it's because I think we've got some really quick wins in there. The data is all there. It's just about combining it and enabling a picture for the commander to be able to uh, present to senior commanders um, uh, when it comes to that attribution and what's actually going on out there. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I'm really excited about this. And certainly, even in the US last week, at the Combined Space Operations Forum, uh, just before Christmas, um, there's a real excitement about sharing, data sharing, and the ability to do that amongst uh, the other partners and nations. It's not easy because of classification levels and so on, um, but I, I think there's a real want to be able to do this um, and a priority to be able to do it right now. Yeah, uh, so Catherine and I have spoken about this multiple times. Um, so Goddard has covered off SDA. I think there's a couple of extra bits to it. 
it's the comment that Natalie brought out earlier, and SDA is almost meaningless unless we are referring it to a baseline of accepted norms of behavior. So that piece of work that we're doing uh, in support of FCDO into the UN is critical to this, uh, so that we can hold people to account on how they act and uh, do their business in space to maintain this idea of a safe, secure and sustainable domain as we go forward. I think there's another bit to this, which is uh, this idea of what would a future space traffic management look like? And that's been a discussion that's quite live at the moment, um, maybe slightly bro broader than what we're trying to achieve with SDA in the defence uh, area. But if you think you know, we're upwards of 8,000 odd satellites on orbit at the moment, the last ESA uh, modeling suggested over 140 million pieces of space debris. Um, if you look at the different licensing applications from some of the big companies that are right there at the moment, the next decade will see tens of thousands of small satellites go into LEO. So space is only getting busier um, and that's going to make our life more difficult when we're trying to look up through that and see what might be potential nefarious activity in amongst all of the debris and the new satellites and all of the ambition. So managing the traffic in, in, in many ways, in a similar way that we manage traffic in the air domain, 100 years ago, if you had had a discussion, you're better place to talk with this, David, than I am, but if you'd had a discussion with the man in the street about jets with 300 people on them landing at 90 seconds uh, intervals on two runways uh, on an airport that's just outside London, they wouldn't have believed you. But if you go forward 100 years from today and look at the exponential rise in activity in space, what's that mean for space traffic management? And I'm absolutely convinced that that is also a key area that we, we, grandly humankind, need to get a grip of uh, before there is some sort of major event in space that then forces us to do it. And just very last thought on that, um, and I agree with everything that's been said. There is, of course, a huge commercial opportunity here as well, and and, and you know we point that out in the strategy. It's one of the sort of high growth areas, actually. You know, this needs emphasis for all the good reasons that you've set out. But actually, as Catherine and I have also discussed, um, there is room here for companies to you know, use that data in innovative ways to help solve problems, to help yeah, you know, and 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 again grow the sort of services, the ancillary services part of our space sector. So again, we talk about synergies. That's another sort of great synergy where there's a real burning need to get the uh, space domain awareness uh, right, but also there's an opportunity there for our companies in the UK to do it well. Well, thanks very much indeed. Um, we've, we've overrun a little bit, but uh, but not, not too grievously. And I'd, I'd like to uh, invite the, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy Professor Linda McKay to uh, close proceedings for us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, John. So it falls to me to be the person who's standing in between um, the end of proceedings and our opportunity to network. So I'll be brief. Great benefit of such an event as this is now our opportunity to talk through the issues that have been raised this afternoon. I'd like to thank the Ministry of Defence, various government departments, the media and the businesses represented in the room for coming along this afternoon to join us at an academic institution, King's College, and thank the Freeman Air and Space Institute in particular for hosting the event. Now, the Minister for Procurement, who had to leave us a little bit earlier, Jeremy Quinn and Mike Wigston, um, Chief of Air Staff, Thank you for sharing with us the policy, defence strategy policy for space. It's alive, it's around us, it's very much in popular culture at the moment. I know many of us will have perhaps engaged with, through our children or ourselves, the recent film Don't Look Up. And those of us who are a little bit older may remember Lost in Space and Warning, Warning, Will Robinson. I think that warning, Will Robinson, you've taken us through all the issues today, from climate change through to the potential for global conflict, the relationship that we need to develop through science and partnership through education, and within King's, of course, 
We have a lot of work ongoing. We're so pleased to partner with you and with other academic institutions. Part of this is about generating our successors. Those scientists, people in the armed forces, in government who will take forward the issues. So I'd like to end by thanking the many colleagues behind the scenes who've helped to make today happen. We have catering, cleaning, security staff, and we have many people in the room here who are now going to take us on to the next stage of the event and the networking. So please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you very much for answering the question so eloquently. Thank you to our colleague for taking the questions through the internet, it was great. But a special thanks to Mike Wigston and Jeremy Quinn for launching the policy this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.